Hello YouTubers, this is the fifth video in our Blazor series where we continue to build uh, industrial uh, enterprise level uh, Blazor applications using server-side uh, Microsoft Blazor with you know the utmost detail that I could possibly share with you when it comes to building something that is end-to-end -end, you know all the way from the API all the way up uh, to the UI and back and like I said before you know going through this series you know will give you the insight you know if you want to be a full stack engineer you want to be able to to me a full stack engineer you know is someone who can uh, build an entire application end to end you know with confidence being able to build the entire application that means you know you're not just sitting in the back end you're not just sitting in the front end you know you are able to build APIs and front ends and you are able to build pipelines and deploy this into production if you can do this that's great if you want to go a little bit higher you can be an, an entrepreneurial engineer which is you know a higher level where you get to be able to actually uh, communicate with clients gather requirements put the design architect the solutions and then be able to actually take it to the market if you can do these things you know that just takes you to a whole new level but that's a topic for a, a, a different video and you know I really highly recommend you look at my series and uh, series and in, uh, in entrepreneurial software engineering you you'll see a lot of content in there that might be uh, eye-opening you know to you um, but back to our blazer application series you know today we want to continue our development in this um, pipeline end-to-end -end application we're trying to register a student and we're going through you know building brokers and services and today we're gonna touch base on the view services and let's talk a little bit about view services let's let's go a little bit here just to remind you what our diagram looks like so the stuff in green in here is the stuff that we have you know walked through together you have the code go look at the code see what the code looks like but today we are working with view services and you know before we jump into the code here I just want to explain something a little bit uh, for you so you just understand what's going on here so your services basically stay true to your API models right if your API is returning a a student and the student has a created by updated by IDs and it has a an identity number for the student that information is not very readable for a person sitting in front of the web application on their machine at home and trying to understand what this is what this is like if you say this student has been registered on the system by and then you put a good value in there that doesn't mean anything right so the view service services main responsibility it has multiple responsibilities but the main responsibility is to take a an incoming a, a retrieved model from the API raw API model and turn it into something human readable something that a person can look at and read and understand number one number two responsibility is not to ask the end user which is what we're gonna go through today in the next few videos when you're registering a student you don't want to enter by hand when this student was registered on the system or when this when this student was you know admitted you know to a particular school you want it to take care of that for you you also don't want it to go find you don't want users to enter their unique identifiers as creators or updaters of a particular record you want to go and call some user service and get that information automatically which is also something that we're going to go through today what that means basically is that in the software industry there's this idea of the MVVM model meaning model view view model you know where you basically are exchanging information between something that's human readable versus API readable and the other way around not everything that is accepted by the the API is necessarily readable by the UI and the other way around so if you if, if I may describe the view services I'd say they are the massager the preparer of data to make it either readable to the API to confirm to the API contract or from the API all the way up to the UI to render things in a way that the uh, person that's using your software is able to understand and read which brings in the next question someone might ask me okay does that mean that view services have their own models absolutely yes that's literally what they do they basically are mappers 
and somewhat orchestrators in the sense that they may call an additional service like daytime broker or a or a user service or whatever the case may be so they can basically collect all the information that we shouldn't be requiring the user that's using the system to look at and use so today we're just gonna talk about the business logic side of things and then maybe in the next session we will cover up all the validations and all the um, uh, exceptions that we need to handle just like we did with the with the normal service let's just jump into um, our situation here so as you can see here we are getting really close we are in the view services right after this one is done we can actually start talking about UI and there's a lot of stuff that I can't wait to share with you when it comes to building test-driven um, uh, uh, industrial enterprise level uh, UI components that are re reusable, testable. Uh, you're gonna love the stuff that um, uh, a lot of you know the contributor contributors to the B unit project you know um, have done to make this easy for us to test drive. All right. So first and foremost, let's just go to our OSS uh, project in here. I made sure that the text is is big enough for people that are on their phones. And let's look at our student model. Our student model here is not quite uh, necessarily true to uh, the API model because when you're basically pushing in a, a student, you know, there is a bunch of information and few things that we want to do because the purpose of this particular video is to just to go through the registration of a student. We're not going to do much, but ideally, you know, created by and updated by when you retrieve actually comes in with a user model like this. And this user model has the first name, last name, and all that kind of stuff. That's how you display that stuff to the end user. But because this this track that we're going in is just registering a student and just seeing it registered in the database, we're going to jump into that at a particular point. But the view service today, main responsibility is to give you these values out of the box based on the person that's logged into the system, which will beg the question, how do we you know, um, establish security? in an ASP, sorry, in a Blazor application, how do we pick that data? Additionally, you should be able to generate that value and generate these two values, right? So the service itself will generate the created by, updated by dates for you. You don't have to worry about that one. And the, um, the created by, updated by uh, values will be based basically based on the currently logged in user, which is a completely different discussion that we're going to have at some point in time. All right, so what does that mean? We need to build a a student, we need to build a student view model. So let's just go in here and say, here is a new folder. And this is student views, all right? It comes in with its own exceptions. It comes in with, with its own everything. But the student view in here that we're gonna build is a little bit of a different version of the student uh, the native student API student model. So let's just go in here and let's just add in these things as follows. So what comes in from the UI? This is the most important question. What comes in from the UI that we necessarily care about? All right. If I look into my student in here, I basically care about things like identity number, first name, middle name, last name, maybe date of birth. Sure, we're going to enter that information. Uh, uh, create a day update date. Nope, we don't have to display that, not just yet, but on the way back from the API, we're probably going to need to add that information, but not yet. That's not what we're looking at yet. You only should only write enough code to get your application running. Don't be a fortune teller when it comes to writing code. I see a lot of engineers go and say, well, we're going to need it in the future. Well, when, when, when we need it, go ahead and build it. You know, unless the decision that you're making is a design decision that will require us to do a complete reroute and rewrite few things. Do not add things that you don't immediately need when you need when you write your software. This is really really important because you know you will end up with a lot of garbage code that is not being used because you never used it. You thought you will, but you didn't. You know I call these people you know code hoarders. You know they hoard code that they don't necessarily need. You know, it's just like if you watch the TV show Hoarders, it's just pretty much the same thing. You know, you're writing code, you're adding data in your system, but, you know, you're not really using 
that information. So only take what you need. And what you need in this particular instance, obviously the model is going to evolve, is just this particular information. The rest of this is technically generated. The rest of all of this is technically generated. I'm assuming also even the, um, yeah, maybe the user ID is probably something that we generate as well. Sure. Let's just go ahead in here and let's create our student view, which is this guy. So we have an identity number, first name, middle name, student gender. We need to get that guy. And I like, you know, a lot of people say, okay, well, let's make this a common model so we can use it. I don't think that's a good idea. I think you should keep your things completely separated uh, because what's going to happen is that if you're going to need to change something or detach something or uh, componentize and ship something, you know, now you're creating coupling unnecessarily. So I'd rather go and say, okay, under the student views, I'm just going to go in here and say student, student gender view like this. Sorry, student view gender like this, which basically means that for that student view model, I have a student view gender and under that it's going to be an enum and what did we do in here? We said that it female, male and other like this. Exact same values. There's nothing wrong with that because there will be a point in time where you want to, to change this, the display name in here. So whatever your value that's coming from the API is, you still want to be true to that. But maybe you want to change that value into something else. Some people might change the display. Some people might change the entire model. Stay separated. Stay very, very clean when it comes to these things because at some point in time, it, it, it will change. From my experience, you see these things, they change all the time. Okay. So we have that. So we have the uh, student view and then this will be student gender view, which is basically just gender. This guy right here. All right. Since they are under the same namespace, this guy should just work like a charm. Okay. And everything else that we have, we don't need. My friend Roberto uh, pointed out that this little, you know, um, broom that we have in here, you know, you could click on it and it could just clean up the uh, all the all the unnecessary usings and any other things that you may not need in your system. So, all right, the view gender and the view. Let's go ahead and build our actual service. All right, there are a few things that we need to consider before we build this service. We need something to give us date time. We need something to go and say, I want to get the date time of here and now. A lot of people go and say, oh, just call date time offset and, you know, get the date time now. But that's not very practical because date times in and of themselves are external dependencies. You're basically reading something from external dependencies. You could be reading it from your system. You could be reading it from the server or you could be reading it from a satellite. Whatever the case may be, we consider this to be an external server and an external resource. And therefore, we need that date time. It looks like we already have that in here, which is fantastic because we're going to use that. <clears throat> the other thing we want to build in here is basically a service that we're going to call user service and its only responsibility is to return the currently logged in user ID. So let's just go ahead and build that in here. So this is users and under users I'm going to do, this is just a dummy service that we're going to come back to uh, later and actually clean up with the with the security and stuff. So this is I user service. And this here is your user service right here. Need a class. Here is your user service right here. <clears throat> and we're just going to put a dummy implementation there. Nothing really serious. We're just going to go and say when uh, the security is implemented. Give me an ID of whoever is the currently logged in user. We're going to have access to an HTTP accessor, which is basically going to give us that kind of information immediately as soon as we need it. So let's just go in here and say <clears throat> public interface. And here's a GUID get currently logged in user. And it's not asynchronous or anything because the values are already there. So most of the time, these values are going to be cached. I'm going to walk you through all the, the details of securing your Blazor application, but I don't want us to deter into that because that's a big topic. I just want you to stay the course with um, uh, with with the view service just to show you the end-to-end -end 
because programming and software engineering you can very easily it's it's a vast vast world where you can go into so many different realms you know there is there's endless possibilities in there so in here I'm just gonna put a dummy implementation I'm just gonna return a new GUID just a new GUID for the time being ideally this will be obviously the UI is gonna reject this sorry the API is gonna reject this immediately because of the you know the value that is being sent to the API it doesn't really match you know the value that we're trying to send here so it's not really gonna uh, gonna fly Okay, but uh, for for this for now for the time being we're just gonna leave it in there, you know, and let it air out when we're actually doing an integration test so we can actually apply security to our system. All right, so this is just a dummy service on the side. Let's go ahead and build the service that we are up to build today, which is student views. We always use plural for folders because these are namespaces, and singular when you actually start building concrete classes and interfaces and that stuff. So let's just go ahead in here and let's go and build an interface. And this is where things get serious, right? I want to go here and say I student view service CS and the I student view service CS has a requirement, right? So this is a value task. It returns the contract that was passed into it. So I'm re expecting to return student view like this, right? And then here we're basically saying add student view asynchronous and it takes in a student view as an input parameter just like this all right so that's your student view here's our work and here is our header file and this is our student views let's go ahead and put in a concrete class for this so let's go ahead and see and say this is my student view service And let's put the implementation of this is student view service control period interface perfect it pulls in all the stuff that we need this is a just a um, I, I can see 16.8 visual studio 16.8.1 I think is a little bit slow it's trying to keep up with me you know but it's a little bit slow it doesn't catch up real fast but it's doing a lot of nice magic on the background hopefully they will optimize it and make it look a little bit faster so all right so this is add student view service it's under 120 characters you can see that in here character 83 we try to maintain 120 characters so people on their laptops whatever the view may be except for phones where we don't expect people to write code on their phones you know it should be 120 should be a good a good rule for that it's just an inherited kind of rule you know there is no great history behind it we just looked at it and said okay 120 is going to be let's draw a line in the sand there and say okay 120 characters is good enough you know move on like that all right so this student view and we're passing in a student view and we need an implementation error because this is test driven development because this is not the wild wild west let's go ahead and just define what the dependencies that we need are so we need two depend we need three dependencies four dependencies actually we need a a student service which is the main main guy and this student service if i know how to type uh, and this student service is where we are going to be calling the broker neighboring service or the foundation service like my friend kylo likes to call it a foundation service is basically what interacts with the API is what we've been building in the last couple of sessions. So this is student service right here. And I also want the user service. So I user service. This is how I'm going to get whoever is logged into the system at this point in time, which is also fine. So this is user service. And I also want a date time service. So I see how see how this view service is kind of an orchestrator because it's pulling out all the ingredients that it needs to actually make the work happen. And we maintain the user service at a service level, so we maintain the balance of the architecture. So this is I date time service. This is my date time. This is the serious stuff right here. I think I called it I date time. So uh, sorry, I date time broker rather. Because it's an external resource as is. This is your date time broker. There you go. And then there is the logging broker, which is really, really important for us. Logging broker like this. 
and um, all right so these are our dependencies we need the student service to actually send the request to the database to the API we need the user service to pick up whoever is logged into the system at a point in time so we can persist that name and pass it downstream we need the daytime broker to get the current date and time and we need the logging broker to actually um, uh, log any issues that may happen obviously because we have exceptions and we handle these exceptions there's dependency validation exceptions there's validation exceptions that we need to take care of all of this is going to be part of this stream all right let's go ahead and build our constructor so you see if you select all this is really nifty nifty gifty if you go and and pick up and select all of these dependencies and do control period it generates the the uh, constructor for you out of the box so here we go there's this guy I like to break them down like this so they are readable to human beings who are supposed to maintain the system all right so we have all these services which is really fantastic now is the time for us to go write some unit tests and I apologize in the last video someone you know um, you know was not very happy that I'm going through every single property and every single step and, and, and test driving it they said it's kind of annoying this obsession with unit tests but I think that you know if you test drive your application you are much more confident in the functionality of your application and much more confident in in your system especially that it gets really really complicated and it's very easy to lose track of what kind of features that you're adding in and what kind of information that you're trying to pass through so any change in code should fire an alarm and these alarms are basically these unit tests you your true documentation of your code is the actual unit tests that you're writing not the function the function itself is great it's, it's going to tell you some great things but the unit test is actually tells you where your focus is what's required and what's not like if you remember in the in the student service in here when we said validate things when we said let's do and put some rules for validation we skipped things like um, uh, middle name and family name or last name because some people in the world don't have these and we shouldn't require these the story here is not going to be told as detailed as the unit tests you know and I'm not really a big believer in adding uh, unnecessary con like a lot of people will go here and say we are not doing this because blah 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 don't do that don't do that uh, try to avoid adding comments in your code as much as you can the only excuse that I would see someone you know that it that legitimizes adding comments and code is f for two cases if you're building an API that is the back end of it is closed source or proprietary you need to provide some details on top of your API endpoint so when you generate a swagger document it makes sense that okay this is the endpoint and this endpoint does one two three four or if you're building a, a proprietary uh, DLL or library and people are calling your methods like when you go in here and you basically call is invalid like this you know it should technically provide you some sort of documentation around sorry this is actually my own method we don't need that in here if I go into a method like this is null or white space and I do this see that little document indicates whether a specified string is null empty or consistent yeah sure because I don't have the source code of this or I don't have immediate access to the source code of this yeah go ahead and add documentation there but for people who go over every method and go and do this stuff and start typing stuff it means nothing it means absolutely nothing the reason why it's actually like uncle Bob always says the reason why these comments and most of the IDEs are you know in a faded color because they're not important they mean nothing they absolutely mean nothing your code should be self-documenting like my friend Daniel always says you know you if you write your code clean enough you don't have to actually wonder what's going on there you know it's it's very very especially for the folks that say chicks checks if ID is invalid I've seen people do this before like they'll go like this and say checks if ID is invalid I'm sorry is that name is not clear enough for you I don't understand right and then some people say well the, sometimes the method is too big that we need to describe exactly what's going on well in that case your code is actually is the problem your code needs to be simple enough to be readable and like I said we try to maintain cleanliness when it comes to the code so this is basically a method if your business logic code is somewhere between 10 and 15 lines fine if it's 50 lines yeah something is seriously wrong with your 
design and something is seriously wrong with your architecture and I highly recommend you know reconsider restructuring your entire system into something that is simple and module smaller code um, uh, portions so you can basically handle you know so, so it's maintainable so it's 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 readable it's attractive enough for people to look at always you know always think about the youngest least experienced person on your team and use these folks to help you with understand whether your code's too complicated or not don't just go and say oh they just graduated out of college and they don't know they don't know what it's like no you don't know what it's like to write maintainable code if they can't read your code so you have to make sure that these are your measure these folks have them sit down and look at your code if they don't understand it your code is bad it's not their problem it's your problem especially if you are a senior engineer or have the experience in 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 the industry for for a particular period of time all right enough with the with the little talk let's just go ahead and build a test for this so the test that we want to do basically uh, ideally we want to be able to pass a student view and then turn that student view into a a student entity and then send that student entity back to the API and then hopefully the API will persist that information that information into the system right now I might make a little bit of a change in here maybe we don't even need to return the student view simply because if this is a form and you are filling in this form there is absolutely no need for you to unless you want to display that data back which is probably not a bad idea sure let's do it this way all right so let's go ahead and write a test for this so let's go here these are my services let's go ahead and build a a, a student views and let's start writing some code so in here here's a class and we're gonna call this student view tests view service tests just like we do across everything and then let's just prepare our uh, main class that's going to provide us with some details about how to map things and do all that good stuff let's just go here and do this and here's public class public partial because we know that this is going to be like just in two seconds so we're going to go and actually and most of these dependencies that we have if you go back into the uh, student view service let's go to the student view service I could just copy my dependencies here and turn them into what turn them into into mocks so if you do alt if you press alt on your keyboard and just drag down like this you can modify multiple lines at the same time which is really awesome you can do much in here though so you have to do it like this you could probably do end or something like that maybe all right let's get some let's get some references going in here for us so as the user service, student service, we have the date time broker, the logging broker, we got them all. Beautiful. All of this is beautiful. Okay. And then we need to probably change this into say mock. Right? So it's mock, mock, mock. In here, all of that stuff. Alright, what else do we need? Someone might ask, what else do we need in here to make the, sure that this is uh, functional for us? We need the the subject of test, which is I student student view service. This is student view service right here. And then we need to be able to initialize all these mocks for us. So let's just go here and persist this guy. And let's go here and here's my constructor. And here's my student service mock. All of these are things that we're gonna test that we're making the right calls to them and using them appropriately in the right place at the right time if you do control space in here it'll give you the value that you're looking for so it's student service mock and then user service mock new user service mock right here and this is my uh, date time broker mock I always notice that the order of things in here based on priority and based on what you use them for also, when we verify no other calls, we need to honor that order. So remember that I said that. There is engineering in the engineering process. That's what I'm trying to say. And then here, this is your logging broker. So this is new mock and that logging broker right here. 
and then at the end we want to basically actually initialize our service right so this is my student view service now that I control the dependencies good old school dependency injection now I can control whatever happens to this service without actually making a real call to the real API so this is student view service and I'm gonna use the aliases in here so student service I think actually I've, I've seen my friend Josh does a nice trick with this let's see if we can if we can use his trick so this is student service mock dot object we're gonna add the aliases in a second uh, user service mock dot object and then this dot date time dot object and then this is the logging broker dot object like this now let's just go ahead and add the aliases so I think what he did was select all control period and then introduce remove suppress ah I don't see it control period add this qualification oh well I guess it's not in there so let's just do this student service so that's the aliases please remember to add that it's really important user service it makes it easy for the person who's reading your code to read what's going on so this is the date time broker and this is in here the uh, logging broker logging broker all right perfect I put in my dependencies I put in my services what else do I need I need a couple of things I need a filler and this filler will basically generate random data for me to um, to pretend that I'm sending something into the system uh, but this filler here there's a trick about this right especially when you're doing mapping a lot of people go and say well you know if I'm doing mapping let me create a a student view service right I like to call this the um, um, this rule Euclid's rule things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other right which means a lot of people when they're writing unit tests they go write an entity and they repeat the exact the exact same logic of the mapping to that entity to the other entity especially when they're doing mapping in their test that's not right you're not doing the right thing let me just stop here and, and explain this a little bit things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other so if a is equal to x and b are e is equal to x then a is equal to b universal rule never changes it just works it's true because it works right which means that if your business logic is to map a to b your tests should not do the same thing your test should not be doing the exact same steps of the business logic that's not smart you're not supposed to do that instead what your test is supposed to be doing is that you create an x and out of x create a and out of x create b then go compare that e is equivalent a is equivalent to b this is really 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 important when it comes to unit testing stuff all right in other words let's put this in layman's terms let's say your method is basically calculating that a plus b equals c right then what your test is going to be doing is going to go the opposite direction of that meaning that you're going to generate a random c and generate a, a, a an out of this random c that's that, that will be your expected value and out of this random c you're, you're going the opposite direction so you're creating the b and the a out of the c so you're starting the other way around which means that out of the C you're gonna go and generate a random B and create a and obviously you're gonna know the value if a by uh, if B by subst and you already have the value of B because you, ge you randomly generated that so you're going exactly in the opposite direction and then you validate at the end that C as an expected result equals equals C that's coming from your business logic if you don't do that you're basically just rewriting your business logic code which is insane don't do that that's not that's not software engineering someone might say to me why does it matter why does that matter I'll tell you why it matters because if the end result is what you're actually validating against you shouldn't actually care how that end result came to be 
then your test is actually validating against that particular end result, not necessarily how the end result came to be. If you're validating how this result is coming to be, then you might need to rethink about why you're writing your, your unit tests in the first place, right? Are you writing code on the wall, just, just making it stay for thousands of years, or do you expect your code to be subject to change and refactoring and code rubs? And as long as the end result is the same, then your code drop and refactoring is legit. Otherwise, it's not. So what are we doing here? Instead of generating random values for um, the student view model and the student model, what we're actually going to be doing is that we're going to be generating a dynamic set of properties. A dynamic set of properties. And out of these dynamic set of properties, we're going to determine you know whether the end result is correct or not. I'll show you this, you're gonna love it a lot. It's exactly what needs to happen. All right, great, let's do that. So that means that I can go here and say um, a private static dynamic. I'm returning a dynamic object and say create random student view properties. And what this what this method does, it's going to return a rand a dynamic object that has its type list. It doesn't have a type in it, but it has all the values that I need to create a particular student entity. So what do I need? I need an ID. So this is good dot random good. That's an easy one. Good dot new good like this. Let's see if we need any dependencies, right? And it has some user ID. Right, which is pretty much the same thing. User ID. So let's go ahead in here and say GUID user ID GUID dot new GUID. And let's just use this value across both unless we want to generate. Do we want the record to be different? Let's make the record different from the user ID just for whatever reason is out there. And then what do we want? We want first name. You want to validate that your mapping is happening. So even for your non-required values, you still want to create values for them to know that this mapping is actually happening. Let's let's go ahead in here and create because we're using this really cool library called Dynamics. It'll allow us to come up with names, real names for people. So this is private static string, uh, get random first name, which is basically new. Oops, let's fix this new real names real name from dynamics and I can inside that real name determine whether it's a first name last name doesn't matter what the case may be so here's a, a first name get value there you go I can do the same with the rest right I can go here and say uh, I can make it even simpler by just going and saying, uh, just leave it as is. Doesn't matter. A first name could be, it could be anything, right? So there's first name, last name, whatever. So we could just go here and just get random name. It doesn't matter whether it's really first name or not. So get random name, and then you have middle name. Get random name, like this. And then what else we have? We want a family name, which is also a random name. And we have a date of birth, date of birth. And let's get a random date. How do we get a random date? You could go here and say private static date time offset. I think we said hours to just date time. Is that right? Oh, it's a date time offset. Sure. So let's go here and say this is get random date because we're not really doing any logical validation at this point it can be any random date really so how do we get a random date so we could say new date time range like this uh, let's see why is it not happy once the date time offset did I forget something private static I don't need a string in here just need date time offset and this is date time 
range and inside that let's have our earliest date to be the earliest date which is a new date time and in here I'm just gonna say get value like this so this basically gives me a random date time which means in the date of birth I can go and say here's a random date get random date like this what other values do we want uh, we want created date, updated date, obviously, but these values are values that we are going to use to determine, you know, those are the real date time, is basically what we're going to be generating to return out of the date time broker. So maybe I could use this as an input parameter. Let's do that. Date time offset dates. Let's call it audit dates. We can do that, can we? Let's break this down a little bit, just so it's, everything is readable on the screen. I know it's a little bit less than um, 120 characters, but still. So this is created date. So that's audit dates. And there's updated date. That's also audit dates. Someone might ask me, say, Hassan, there's no autocomplete in here. Of course, it's a dynamic object. You can literally do whatever you want in here. And it becomes a property. And that property becomes a string. And it's going to be happy with it. And that's the beauty of these dynamic properties. These dynamic properties, back to Euclid's rule, if A is equal to X and B is equal to X, then A is equal to B. Things that are equal to the same thing are equal to each other. This is our X right there. This is the, the bag that we create from it, the input and the output, and we just say, okay, is the mapping really happening? Because you're not really repeating your logic at this point in time. You're just filling in data from an existing existing bag of information. And then you have the created by. So this is created by, this is the ID, right? So you want to go here and say, um, we want to mock this one as well, right? So this is audit dates. And we want in here to say audit IDs, right? So this is the audit field. So here's my audit IDs. And updated by, this is also my audit IDs, like this. Great. So I have created by, updated by, but that's not enough. That's not enough. Why? Because if we're going to return that entire object back, then we need to map back to whatever response we received. I will hold off on that for a little bit. I will hold off on that for a little bit. I'm just going to go and say, OK, just, just push, push the object in and persist it and say submission successful. That's it. Just say submission successful stop right there all right so i have created by updated by uh, created date um, i have all the fields that i need which is fantastic all right that means i don't really have to create any other fillers let me just go and see if i missed anything in the student model before i move forward gender i forgot the gender yes 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 let's go ahead in here and just create a private static uh gender and this will be, what do I call it, student gender? Yeah. Get random gender, like this. And there's many ways you could do this, actually. There's many, many, many ways you could actually generate a, um, a, a random uh, gender. You know, you can you can, for instance, get the maximum value and then based on this value, you can basically return that with a mapping because this is random. You can actually go here and say random gender um, uh, hash or hash code, random gender value here. And then you can go here and say student gender. Um, I don't even remember how you get the um, let's say enum dot. get values and this is your student gender and this you could just say length or something does that work so now that you have the length that should work what does it need the, the type okay type of type of student gender like this does that work there you go. And then out of that, you could basically, so, so this is this is basically the max gender value, right? So this is the maximum, max gender, um, uh, student gender, 
um, uh, count or, or ah, student gender count. Okay, that's my count. I can now return and say, okay, so you can go here and say return and then student gender, which is just mapped, mapped in student gender like this. And I can go here and say uh, int range, right, with the minimum value being zero because, and then the maximum value non-exclusive, which is legitimate to the, to the length, that would be the student gender count. And that will basically give me the value. And that is that. Let's clean it up a little bit. Let's clean it up a little bit. Let's take that in here. Let's just go here and say int uh, random student uh, gender value like this. It's much cleaner. And then you want you don't want to scare people when they look at your code. You just want them to look at it. And, and there's probably there's a thousand ways you can do this. There's a thousand, thousand ways you can do this, but this is basically one way you can just get random gender. Because we need the random gender in here and we need to map it, we need this. We don't want to do the mapping even inside the uh, code that we're doing. I'm just going to go here and say student gender. And this is random student gender, get random gender like this. And then in here I can go and say, okay, because this is a student gender, I'm just going to go here and say, let's put that a little bit above the field. So this is student, let's say gender. This is random student gender and also gender view, which is basically a student gender view. Or is it student view gender? How did we do it? Student view gender. Like this. Come on, give me something. Control period. And then we can map this to random student gender as well. So this way I got both both worlds mapped in to the same to the same idea here. Alright. What else do I need from a student entity? I think we got them all. So you got the you got the user ID. Oh, we need an identity number, which is basically just a random string. It doesn't matter what it is. Let's go back here and let's write a method. An FT method in here, static string get random string. And this is again new mnemonic string got get value. So that basically gives you the value of the um, uh, identity number, which is also above the audit field. So let's just put it in here. Get random string. There you go. So I created this bag, this dynamic bag of information, and I have this information right there. And now I can, you know, very peacefully go and write some tests to validate all the stuff that I'm that I was just up to uh, up to build. So let's just go ahead and build that test. So here's a copy, paste. I have this nice file down here. It's called um, student view service test dot logic dot cs. And inside, this is my file right here. I'm just going to remove that redundant information just because I copied the main file. Let's take that out. And let's go ahead and write some tests. Public async task should add student view async. Given, when, then. Like I said, a lot of people have different terminology, but when you break things apart like that, I talked earlier about comments. You know, I said only when you have a legitimate reason to use them. This is a good legitimate reason to use comments. Some people like to use regions. And if you're not familiar with regions, it's basically you can encapsulate a portion of your code by j simply just going and saying hash region given like this. And then you can say end region like this. And then whatever you type in here, like if you say, for instance, I don't know, a string x equal Hassan, like this, control KD. You can basically collapse that region, see how it collapses? But it's kind of frowned upon, it's frowned upon in um, the software engineering community amongst a lot of developers. They don't really like regions so much. And I didn't quite, like to me, I'd like to see 
like if you need to use regions that means your method or your file is way too big that you're trying to use regions to basically just see only what you care about which is basically contrary to what contrary to what we're doing here we're trying to maintain like all our tests if you look at a test ideally in the normal view if I'm not zooming in you know from 17 to 42 or 43 go over take about 20 lines of code 25 lines of code right 26 right um, 20 lines of code I can read everything I can see everything it's telling me one story but if your code is some 2,000 lines of code yeah it, it gives the sense that you want to go and use regions which I really don't you know I don't really use personally I don't I, d I don't see the, the the need for it yet but maybe I will we are growing even after 20 years of experience into this industry I'm still learning things every day and because there's smart smart people in this industry that continue to contribute to the overall architecture we're growing really fast with AI and machine learning so there's always a room to learn all right given when then let's just put our um, let's put our assumptions here right so uh, let's go ahead in here and say current logged in user ID so I'm gonna get go here and say you know I need a current logged in user ID so that's an ID in here and I also want a date time offset random date time so this is random current logged in user ID Let's say random user ID. I like this more. And this is random date time, and I need to get random, get random date time. There you go. So I have date time, so this is a date time, and I need to set those up because these are the dependencies. So this dot um, uh, user service mock dot setup service. Look how I'm setting up the service. Get current logged in user. This guy will return returns random user ID okay so that's one and I also want to set set up the date time so this dot date time mock setup and this is a broker and this is a broker dot gate current date time returns random date time all right great we set up the dependencies where we need to know who's logged into the system at this point in time and what time is it so we can log in that information great wonderful beautiful 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 stuff now let's continue with our uh, build in here right now I have a a, a dynamic um, a random student view properties I'm gonna go here and say get random get student what did I call my method to get my random data Create random student view properties. Yes, because we're creating something for Skype. Right. And with that method, we need to provide a couple of variables, right? What do we need to provide with? We need the uh, audit uh, audit dates, which is random date time, and audit IDs, which is random user ID. All right, because this is a multi-liner, I'm going to put an empty line between the one-liners and the multi-liners just to make things readable and easy all right so I created my X in Euclid's theory I created my X variable now I need to extract from that X the A and the B because I'm working backwards when I'm writing unit tests so that means I can go here and say student uh, view this is my student view this is random student view and this student view is a new student view well if we're gonna if we're gonna do that then we may as well just remove this if your right side is clear just go ahead and say var if your right side is not clear do not use var all right let's add in some information so the ID in here now this guy has more specific information than the other one right so I need an identity number so it's random student view properties dot identity number it, IntelliSense will not help you here because this is a random a random object like I said and then in here we want what we want a first name random student properties dot first name uh, middle name 
random student view properties dot middle name and I think I have family did we do family name or last name okay last name which is random student view properties dot I think I did family name let's see what I did and let's see what the model is actually saying um, so in the original student object did I say family name or last I said last name all right so that means this guy shouldn't say family name, then it should say just fa uh, last name. Last name, family name, who cares? It's pretty much the same thing. All right, last name. So in here, it's not going to error out because it doesn't know anything. It's a, it's a dynamic model. I want you to pay really close. If you can come out of this video with just how you apply Euclid theory in unit testing in software engineering, I'm okay with that. But if you really want to know about Blazor, you probably need to understand the rest of the things that I'm saying. Okay, so this is that and then there's a gender. So random student properties view properties dot and what did I call it? Did I say I said gender view. You're not supposed to be doing any mapping building these properties. So that's that and then the last thing is date of birth random Properties dot date of birth. I think I called it date of birth instead of birth, uh, birth date or something like that. Yeah, date of birth. Let's call it birth date. Just to stay consistent. Try try not to be too smart when naming things. Don't bother people when they're writing your code. Let's let it be intuitive. Okay. Don't change things. It's weird, right? Okay. So we built that student view. Let's build the other one out of it which is var random student which equals student and we're gonna build our student out of that. It's gonna be very similar to this guy though so why not steal this and then add the rest of the properties. What are the rest of the properties? Created by which is random user ID and then there is the updated by which is also a random user ID and then there is a created date which is uh, random date time because that's what we're going to get back from and then there is updated date which is random date time and then what else do we need we need an ID right at the top this is random student view properties dot ID okay so we did everything I think identity number I think I forgot user ID random student properties dot user ID and just to make sure, in case you missed anything in a property, so you don't go back and forth between the model, if you do comma and do control space and it doesn't come back with anything, I think you're in the clear. You have already finished all the properties. Let's see if we are missing anything in here. Nothing. Just async and static, which is nothing. All right, so, so look at our test. We built this random student from this dynamic property. We may move this into a method behind the scenes because this guy doesn't matter. This is just a response from the API that we're confirming to but this is actually what we're gonna confirm to as from a comparison standpoint and I'm gonna come to that in a second alright so you have an ID you have all that kind of stuff that's fantastic what do we want to test then we want to test that we're passing this as input and that it, this input gets converted into this and that we're confirming that this call has happened as a side effect. Now whether we return a value and display it on the UI or not, we're going to talk about that in, in a different session. But for the time being, this is basically what we want to do. These are the things that people can enter as a view model and these are the things that we're supposed to be sending down to the API, which means, which brings us to this situation. We need to set up something in here that says this dot student service, which is, this is the last mock that we're doing. Set up service service dot add student async or register student async great we should, we should change ours as well so this is register student async and it should be it is same student as why is it same student as because what you're passing in has a different reference because you're going to do that mapping inside of your business logic and in order for you to do that mapping inside of your business logic you're not going to get the same reference so you need an additional library that's called compare logic. Let's pull that library in. 
private read only i compare logic and i don't think this library is installed but thanks to the great great integrated development environment that we're using we have been using for almost two decades it's smart enough to go find the libraries for us compare logic so this compare logic what it's doing it's basically going and saying this compare logic compare two entities when you are mocking when you are setting things up compare two entities regardless of the reference of that entity does that make sense which means we need to initialize that guy in here so this dot compare logic equals new compare logic like this and maybe we want to also discard the ID part because the ID that you're generating is going to be different the ID from someone else is generating it's going to be different so many different ways and, and forms so we don't really care about that one so let's just go in here and say um, var compare config right and this is comparison config right here and watch what I'm gonna do here compare config dot prop uh, let's see comparison config new new comparison config and then here I can go and say uh, property ignore property so when you are comparing two objects of the type student ignore the ID property on the student entity so this way when I'm saying compare two student entities don't worry about the ID because that's randomized we don't really care about that and then we need a method in here let's collapse everything just to see the world control MO and then in here I can go here and say well I need a method in here private static static funk student and boolean so that's the result same student as I probably need this as an expression actually expression Oop. here's an expression of a funk that takes in a student and in here I'm gonna pass in my expected my expected student so this is student expected student and this guy goes and basically says return um, actual student so this dot compare logic let's see let me pull in the expression reference here so it plays along yeah so this guy here this dot compare come on or is it uh yeah compare logic oh because it's static it doesn't read yeah that's right sorry about that compare logic dot uh, compare and in the compare here's my expected student and here is my actual student and then I want to return and say are equal so I'm basically trying to go back and say are these two students equal you know what it's small enough we could probably put them both are you under 120 character yes you are great like that so I'm basically returning and saying are these students the same despite the ID you can go to the extreme and say well why don't I just control this from the input parameter which is legit you can you can totally do that so this is register student async and in here you're basically it is the same student as and you're passing in here your expected student which is this guy right here so the reality of the situation from a chronological standpoint this guy should come before this guy I was wrong this random student in here I could go and say student expected input student equals random student so the student is coming from that guy and that expected input student is what I'm gonna pass in here great and when that happens when that happens you can basically return could be the same value uh, returned student which really don't care about necessarily don't really care about we will at some point in time but not in this case here return student you can go here and say returns async returned student which is basically the same value that you just passed in now some people do smart stuff right some people go and say well 
I want to also compare the ID. I want to be strict down to the core. I want to also know the ID of the student that came out. You can actually do something interesting in here. You can go and say <sighs> input student, some input student, and then under there you can do whatever you want you want with this input student as long as as long as you're returning it. Some people do smart stuff like that. Uh, I don't know about, you know, I understand that, you know, some people like to do this. This is one way to do things, but it's basically like a spy where you actually get to see. Let me see if I can make it actually work. Um, let's see. Yeah, see, in one of the overloads, you can actually do a funk. And this funk basically is equivalent to whatever you're trying to do here. You can, I think you can do something like this, but it gets really hard to read. And it becomes very tough to understand, which is why I use the other route. Let's see if I can make this work for you. Is it like this? Yeah, I can't even remember. It's it's one way you can basically capture whatever you're returning as a funk, and uh, basically, you know, you can you can capture whatever was passed into this function, and then based on that, you get to determine what was actually passed in, and then you compare that fully, just a, the normal way you compare anything else. If you want to do it this way, it's fine. If you want to do it that way, this is the way I choose to do it. There's a way to do it, but this is the way I choose to do it. Okay, so in here I'm basically saying this setup, we expect something similar to this to be passed in, and that's that. So see, I look at my test now. This is my input. This is my expected input to the API, and here are things, how, how we're building them. All right, and we may, for the time being, just return the view model itself. So this guy becomes in becomes your... You can do student view in here and say expected student view equals input student view. And you can create another one on top of that that says this is my random student view. And this is my input student view. All right, so you got your input, you created your random from random values from your X, you created your A, and now I'm just giving them nice names. So when you're reading your code, you actually make sense. We're gonna come back and refactor this a little bit, do a little bit of a code rub, just so you see what's going on. This is meant to show you the simulation of the rendering and the mapping that's gonna happen on the business logic. All right, so that means in a student view in here, I can just go and say student view, actual student view await this dot service this is my student view service dot add student async and i'm passing in my input student view see so the variables they're pretty much reflection of the same thing but it's helping you a lot when you're actually building your software this way let's go back here and say then actual student view should should that's your um uh, fluent assertions library should be equivalent to expected student view, which I also built in here. So everything is just as simple as that. We want to verify that these dependencies were called. So let's just make sure that we called actually these dependencies. I can copy all of these. And instead of a setup, I will say verify, verify, and verify. And instead of a returns, I'm just going to go here and say times once Make sure that this one was called once. Make sure that this one was also called once. And make sure that this last one was also called just one times. Times once. Does that work? Happy, happy? Happy, happy. Great. At the end, we want to make sure that, okay, in the chronological order, um, we start with the date time, broker mock for a final other calls. We start with 
the user service or find no other calls. And the last thing is here is the student service mock, verify no other calls, and even the dependencies that we've never called. We just want to make sure that nobody's doing any any weird stuff when it comes to any, any other dependencies. So that's basically, if I click here, the, the broom. Yeah, there you go. So this is our test here. Let's walk through what we did. We created some random values. We created this random value. We created our input and our expected. We expect it to return that value. And then this is my random student that I'm passing into the API, considering all the values that I've re retrieved from these different dependencies. And then in here, this is my expected input and the returned student, which we're not going to do anything with it today, but later we will as we expand on the student view. And then here is my actual student, and there you go, the rest of the test. This is my test right here and now is actually yeah I'm gonna just leave it in here until we actually come back and actually simplify this a little bit but because you can see the given and when and then things are starting to make a little bit more sense for you from a mapping standpoint if you're doing mapping of any kind you're gonna have to run through these uh, these particular particular steps you know just one more thing before I if I do this would that work? See how stubborn I am? I like to see if something is working correctly or not. Async returns. Huh. Yeah. I'm going to need to look it up. But basically, this is one way you can basically capture whatever was passed in and and do whatever you want with it anyway all right so we have this guy all right we have our validations everything in here let's go ahead and run our test so control rt and let's see it fail so this is the the failing part of the system here we go mm -hmm. Takes a second. Is my test. Loading B unit stuff. Something very interesting I noticed about 16.8 since we upgraded from 17 to 18 to support .NET 5. Uh, when you run the tests, the first time takes a little bit of time, and I could probably, I, I might have enabled something to load uh, symbols or whatever the case may be, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just loading everything. It's probably a settings in here that says uh, loading symbols, debug, general. Warn when using, run automatically. Yeah, there's probably something in here where you can actually. Yeah, there you go. Just in time debugging of these types of code. Manage native and scripts. Probably something like that. Anyway, so something here failed. It basically said cannot can implicitly convert type GUID to string. Where did that happen? This is because we're using a user ID. Oh yeah, that's right. The user ID is a, is a string. See, that's the thing that you don't see until you do actually uh, debugging. Yeah, this guy needs to be a string because this is the user ID. We, we set it up as a string. So that, that has to be like that. As far as I remember, how did we set up that user ID on this guy? Yeah, this guy is a string. Okay, great. See, now the second time I do control RT, it should probably just go real fast. And these are the things like when you're dealing with dynamic objects, you're going to run into this all the time. You're not going to get a while you're editing kind of errors because it's dynamic. Nobody knows anything about it. All right, ideally, what you want to see is that, okay, we still have that convert type. 
uh, student view gender to student vendor explicit conversion exist are you missing a cast uh, where where did I do that so this is gender view yes is that what I called it gender view yes this is student view, random student gender and this is student gender. okay this is good did I miss on the students oh, yeah this needs to be gender all right let's try this one more time control RT Ah, it's loading these things again. There you go. So now if I go and verify this, it should say method or operation implement. And if you're pairing with someone and you have a failing test, don't just say, oh, it went red. Give it back to them. No, you have to run it and make sure that you're still getting the right result of failure, not just the failure, that the right result of failure so people don't get mad at you, you know. So give people the right, the right um, uh, piece of information. So all right, so this is a failing test. So this guy is fail, right? So we built a bunch of stuff and now it's time for us to make this pass. So let's go ahead into the business logic of this and let's implement this. So what do we need in here? We need to map the student view into a student, right? So this is student, student map to student this is a method that's going to take this student view and turn it into something that we can use in our operation, right? So that means I need a function in here. This function is going to take a student view and map it into a student. Great. So in here I can go and say current logged in user ID this dot user service dot get currently logged in user right and then I also want the date time offset so this is here current time and uh, uh, current date time so this is dot date time broker dot get current date time so that's this guy right here and uh, what's left is just to create the student object. So this is this guy. And let's just fill that information real quick. I think we can get all of this from that little mapping that we've done in here. Right here. Except that's going to be very different. Quite different, actually. So in here we say GUID.new GUID, like this. And uh, instead of this, it's going to be the student view, which is great, great, great. And this is dot new GUID, like that. And then you have current logged in user. And this will require the mapping. So this will be student gender, like this. And the student view has what? Does the student view has, do we actually have, um, oh, we, we, we decided to generate, uh, let's see, does this guy has an ID? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And we determined that this guy is also going to be set up by the server, so we probably shouldn't even care. So I'm going to do that, but before I do that, I should... Uh, and this guy is going to be a string, right? So it could be anything. String of height, user ID, like this. Yep. Which means that in our test, we probably need to fix this to also say ignore this value as well. This user ID value right here when you're comparing. Because that's going to be set up by the server. It's not even something at the realm of the UI, so we shouldn't care setting it up okay so we have all of that stuff this is great so I mapped to a student now the next step is to go and say well await this dot student service dot register student and I'm passing in that model that I converted like this great and then I'm gonna return that student view that I just passed in just for confirmation 
I need a synchronous in here because this is an awaited call. And let's see if we can pass the test. So I just did a little mapping method in here that takes in that view, which is coming from the outside world, into something that makes sense in the inside world. So let's run our tests. Here we go. Run, run, run. Right, uh, let's see, did we fail? Let's look. Let's see what errors we got. So we'll click here, see what error we have. It says expected invocation once, but zero times. And it's basically saying this register student call that we've made did not match the call. Uh, so something is up. We didn't compare these right. Let's make sure our business logic is doing the right stuff. Let's see. All right. Let's see. So in here, we basically said it is the same student as expected input student. And this is expected input coming from random student. And this random student is coming from all of these random student view properties which is which are not in here and then identity number first name middle name last name gender date of birth uh, all right let's see what we're throwing in here let's debug let's do a little bit of debugging so in our business logic in here does this compare you have the expected student with the actual and this is our compare logic and our compare logic, we already said ignore these two values. So that should be, ah, I forgot to pass in that compare config in here. My bad. Bad, bad Hassan. All right, let's go back here and let's try to run our tests one more time. Because if these properties don't match, you're not going to get a lot out of it. So let's see if that works. There you go. So we have a passing test. So that basically, what this basically is saying is that you, we have implemented a successful functionality that takes in an input from the outside world and turns it into something that is human readable. All right. This is just a breakthrough into our uh, view services. You can see the orchestration that happened in here. You can see how the uh, the view service in reality, actually a view service, if you look a little bit into the orchestration that a view service is doing, let's take a little bit of a, a new page in here. So this is your student view service. The reality is that this student, ver uh, this student view service is actually calling, orchestrating the calls between two services, the user service, and your student service, like this. So it's basically orchestrating this call, and it's responsible about making sure that whatever gets sent downstream to the broker, to the student broker, the API broker, is exactly uh, the uh, model that the API is expecting. Some of these properties, like I said, some of these properties might be filled in by the server. Some people might even argue, say, you know, you don't have to set the date time, you know, on the, the UI. Keep the UI simple and thin and all that kind of stuff. And I'm okay with that. You can do that. Some people say, no, I want to capture the date and time with the UTC, like the time zone where that user has already passed in that value. So if you're using date time offset, you can actually capture the exact time zone where a particular, if you're building an international software, you probably want to keep track of that particular data on that particular information for whatever reason, for whatever reason. Um, this is the student API broker here. 
And then also the same thing happened with the user ID. Like some people will say, well, why, why did you set up the user ID to be ignored? The user ID is something that the system is going to propagate to create an account for the user. So we don't even know what that ID is, you know, so we may as well ignore it. We can completely ignore it from both models. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, the user service, however, is going to be something that talks to its own um, uh, broker to get in, uh, you know, the HTTP accessors which is a big topic about security in Blazor that we're going to be talking about also in this series. So today we already broke into these view services. The rest is something that I have already talked to you about and I'm going to talk about again in the next because this is an, a real project actually. The fact that you know I'm making a video about this, this is not just a demo project, this is actually a real project that needs to be done and I'm taking this as an opportunity so you, I can show you how to build you know, real life end-to-end -end application um, uh, with Blazor Enterprise uh, server-side um, um, uh, library. Uh, so, so the next video, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, validation, what kind of things that we need to do in the validation. And while we're at it, we're going to be handling also the exceptions. There might be exceptions coming from the user service. There might be exceptions coming from the student service. We're going to be mainly focusing on the on the student service because there's no actual implementation behind the user service yet. We're just trying to build the pipeline. Um, once that view service is done, this is when we start getting into the fun stuff, the UI stuff. You know, if you look on the map in here, which is going to be probably uh, the video after this one, I'm going to show you how to build a base component. Mainly we need a button and we need a text box. And we need to be able to put that information in the text boxes and then hit the button and then the button will send the information to the view service to, for it to be persisted in the UI. And then we're going to take some time to uh, style our, our, our system. We want our system to be a little bit stylish. You want to make sure it looks nice. You want to, I'm going to introduce you to some interesting libraries like Sync Fusion Blazor, which basically, you know, gives you the ability to add in some themes, it takes care of all the back end. I'll show you the entire abstraction of um, uh, UI components, just the exact same way we abstract brokers and whatever whatever they get their information from. It doesn't matter because um, you can at any point in time switch the theme, switch the UI components, switch whatever you want to switch with it, without having to worry about these both entities basically live in the same, sorry, these, this entity as well, lives in the same realm, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. And then I'm going to show you the components and I'm going to show you how to put this on a page and talk about the routing, you know, how the routing works. You know, when you log in, you capture that user information and then immediately you send it down to the user service. So this view service can actually take advantage of it and make it and make it work. That's pretty much it for today. I hope this was informative and enjoyable as usual. Please feel free to reach out if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, um, or you just you know want to drop by and, and say you know I have ex you know additional information. Hassan, you might have missed something. I'm more than open to hear your feedback. Uh, and as usual, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in another video.